Hi, welcome to Wikidigi. So now we are going to talk about a very different area that's uh, GATE exams. So GATE is one of the very important exams for the higher studies in India. So like I'm going to talk about the sample questions uh, for a CSE and IT department. Oh, the, those people will be having the subjects like um, the major subjects is theory of computation, compiler designs, networking, operating system, database management system and most of the mathematics are there. Probability and queuing theory and everything is there. Okay, now I'm going to have a yeah, mix up of everything under uh, digital systems and principles. Everything I'm going to have a mix up of everything I'm going to explain to you. Let's start it. So, like, uh, my name is Venkat. I'm a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional Award winner. Apart from that, I'm a software trainer and also like a uh, yeah, kind of uh, job consultant. I'm guiding the students to get jobs and also like uh, I'm providing guidance for the career. Okay, this is the first question. The question is like in an entity relationship ER model, we got an entity relationship ER model. Suppose R is a relation, a more many to one relation. So here there are a lot available and here very less available, many to one. Okay, from entity set E1 and entity set E2, assume that E1 and E2 participate totally in relation. So all the objects here and all the objects here is participate in the relation that the cardinality of E1 is greater, the number of elements in E1 is greater than E2. Cardinality is the number of elements. Which one of the following is true? This guy is more when compared to that guy. So 1, oh, that should be many. So every entity in E1 is associated with exactly one entity, exactly one entity in E2. Uh, maybe like uh, A can be an answer. Some entity, some entity in E1 is associated with more than one entity in E2. No, no way. Because many to one, many to one, so more than more than one is wrong. Every entity in E2 is associated with exactly one entity in E1. Possibility is there. Possibility is there. Every entity in E2 is associated with at most one entity at most. No. At most one entity in E1. No. So the option may be like we are able to on seeing the question answer itself, we are able to remove two things. Either A is an answer and C is an answer. Let's see which one is the answer. So I'm trying to draw the relationship uh, the E1 and E2. So over here I got my E1 which is related to it is related to E2. So this is the relationship between this one and they called us ER model. So I got the cardinal elements in E1 example I got some uh, four elements because many to one relationship. So obviously like many to one relationship is there ok. So exactly E2 is exactly with the one entity in E1 that is not a condition. So no entity in E1 can be related to more than one entity in E2 and an entity in E2 can be related to more than one entity in E1. Yes obviously. So this guy can have more entity right. So every entity in E2 is associated with exactly one entity in E1. No. So C is also wrong. Okay, so previously we discarded B and D and I am discarding the C also because each entity can have more. This guy can be related to more. Okay, this is wrong. So obviously the one answer which satisfies is every entity in E1 is associated with exactly one entity in E2. That could be the answer. The answer is A. Now the set of all recursively enumerable languages is what? Closed under complementation, closed under intersection, a subset of the set of all recursive language and uncountable set. The set of all recursive enumerable languages is, I think, a subset of all, like a, of all recursive language, it can't be, it can't be because it can't be like a subset set of all recursive languages. Maybe like there will be like interrelated languages also. So C can be discarded. An uncountable set, that should be a finite number. No, D is not an answer. C is not an answer. See, I got a language. The language can be related to another language or cannot be related to another language. C, not possible. 
it should be countable, right? So I got uh, considering I got English, 26 alphabets is there. You got a countable, right? So this is not possible. And we have to see these two things. So I discovered two areas. Let's see the answer. So the regular language is enclosed in context free, context sensitive and this is recursive enable. So for recursive enable, the set is not a subset of RSA language and is a countable set. So this is like I discarded these two, these two is discarded. Then the set closed under intersection, but not complementation. Okay, this is the like a keyword you should understand. REL or close under union, intersection, and concatenation and clean or clean closure. Okay, but not complementation. So the set of all recursively enumerable languages is closed under intersection. Okay, so option B is the answer. So they may ask you union or concatenation, you can put it. Let's move on to the next question. Let N be a non-finite autom on non-deterministic finite automaton with n states. K be the number of states of a minimal like a discrete finite automaton. Okay, which is equivalent to definite definite finite automaton, which is equivalent to n. So this is uh, n states. N is a NFA with n states, and K is the number of states for a minimal DFA, which is equivalent to n. Which one be the following is necessarily true? Okay, so this is going to be real interesting. So K, it is a minimal DFA, right? K is a minimal DFA. K should be lesser. K should be lesser. No. So option A is discarded. K should be lesser because you can see NFA, I got 10. Minimal DFA will have 2. Minimal DFA. Okay, it will have 2 or 3. Okay, so K should be lesser. B, it's discarded. So from these two, that should be an answer. I guess, let's see like what is the answer. Okay, so before that, let's uh, understand like, uh, let's see like I'm curious to understand, learn the answer. What could be the answer? What could be the answer? The answer is k less than or equal to 2 power n, <laughs> the option d is the answer. So I will go with the explanation like uh, how it works. Over here like I got a language L1. So we should understand what is complementation process in DFA. Okay, so complementation, what is complementation process? First let us talk about the DFA first. So what is the, like a DFA? So over here you are able to see the language L1 is a MT, AB, AA, ABAA, ABB. B A. So this is the one and the language L2 is A B, A A B, A A A. So obviously got some information. So L2, if I want to get L2, L1 complement will give L2. L1 complement will give L2. Okay, this is called a complementation process. You may ask me how. Okay, so you are able to see it here. I got my, I got my A, like a, there is a language with a parameter, I got the B. And putting the another parameter, you got A. Giving one parameter, you got B. Giving parameter, you got A. This is called a complementation process. See, you can see it here. Over here, I am trying to make, I am trying to add A here. Okay, considering I try to add A here, automatically you are able to get this one. I am trying to add A here, you will be getting this one. Okay, this is how you are able to generate. Okay, so a set of all strings with an even length, if you add one, if you add A here, the number is become odd, which is L2. So, like uh, considering two elements are there, if you add one, it will become an odd number. If you add another, it will become even number. If you add another, it will become odd number. So, obviously, you will be getting, you will be getting this one. L1 is a complementation of L2. Okay, so I'm trying to draw the DFA here. So AB is here. If you add A, it will become ABA. ABA. So 2 becomes 3. So L1 becomes L2. If you add another A or something like that, it will become 4, become L1, even. 
If I add one, it will become L2. So this is how this is called a complementation process that accept the string and complementation process. Okay, so this is how it will be. Ah. So for designing the LFA for L2, we just need to complement the above DFA. We'll change the non. So you're able to see it here. This is like this is the final state. Automatically, the final state is changing between this one. I change it here. The non-final state will become a final state, and final state became a non-final state. Okay, so this is called a complementation process. You may ask me a question: What is non-deterministic finite automaton? Okay, so over here I'm in a state. I'm giving one. If I give one, it may become Q, or it can be P also. So I couldn't predict what's going to happen. I'm giving one. It will automatically become like it will come back to P maybe. If I'm giving one, it will become P or it can become Q. They called us non-deterministic finite automaton. Okay. If you talk about deterministic finite automaton, if I give one, it will go there. It will give zero, it will go there. So if it gives zero, it will be here. If it is one over here. But zero over here, one it will be here. Zero. So they define the state. Give this value, it will go there. Give this value, it will go there. That's called deterministic. Fine. You can determine what's going to happen over here. You can't determine what's going to happen the next stage. It's called non-deterministic finite automaton. Let's move on to the problem. So, like I got n, I got n states, and over here I got. Uh, the minimal DFA is k, so k should be lesser than n. So obviously this is discarded and this is discarded. Okay, so obviously you'll be having NFA which is converted into DFA. Okay, this DFA will become a minimal DFA. A minimal DFA. So obviously this is two power n. So like automatically it's getting converted. So obviously you'll be having two power n here. Okay, two power n data. Convert to DFA from DFA, it will become K. So obviously, K is lesser than two power n. That's the that's the equivalent data. Okay, the answer is option D. Okay, so let's move on to the next problem. Consider a process executing on an operating system. So the question is on operating system that uses demand paging. Okay, so the average time for a memory access in the system is m units. If the corresponding memory available page is available in memory and D units, if the memory access causes a page fault, okay. So I'm accessing the, the some data. Everything is there, and if there is any data is missing out, there is a page fault. It haven't experimentally measured that the average time taken for a memory access in the process in the process is x units. Which one of the following is the correct explanation? They gave this explanation, so I couldn't judge it now. Let's move on to the problem. So average time for a memory access is m units if page hits. That's the one it's given. Average time for a memory access d units if page fault occurred. Okay, so the total average time taken for a memory access is equal to x units. So memory average memory access time is equal to one minus page fault rate. This is one minus d. 1 minus uh, page fault rate into the memory access time when no page fault uh, plus page fault rate into memory access time when page fault is happening. So obviously the page fault is uh, I am trying to push it so 1 minus p 1 minus p that's the page fault into the m the m units is h plus p into d. So solving this one m minus m into p plus p into d m plus is equal to p into d minus m. So x minus m is equal to p into d minus m. So the page fault rate is equal to x minus m divided by d minus m. So that's the answer. Okay. So like before going ahead with the next question, let's talk about like a what is compiler design. So compiler design is nothing but uh, Converting your um, like a, a human level languages like I got an uh, like a int a is equal to 10 or something like that. This particular program is converted into yeah, intermediate course and everything and this is getting optimized and it is executed and I'm getting the output. Okay, so these are the steps available. You got a lexical analysis. So 
like uh, segregating as tokens, checking the syntax, check the semantics, generate the intermediate code, optimize the code and the final code is generated which is getting executed. Okay, this is how your compilers will be working and all this information is stored in the symbol table manager and if there is any error occurred it is handled by this error handler. These are called as phases of compilers. Now let's talk about the syntax analysis. So once if I gauge, so if I gauge a string automatically like I am trying to fetch it out like if there is an error automatically it will be thrown. The reason is like uh, it's checking the syntax over here. I misread a semicolon. So the tree which is drawn in the syntax analysis is called a syntax tree. Sum is equal to num1 plus num2. So and the na other name is called a passing. The next one is semantic analysis. Over here, it will check for the meaning of the data. Over here, I can see you can see it here. Int num1 comma num2 in sum is equal to num1 plus num2, and it's throwing an error num1 and num2 is not available, which indicates it is not initialized. Num equal to zero or num equal to ten, it's not initialized. You're trying to add it. The syntax is correct, but you lost the semantics, and you are able to see the syntax tree is here, and this is a semantic tree. So for eight eats, the meaningful values is defined. They call it as a semantic analysis or analyzer. And after getting uh, the code, after semantic analysis, uh, so this is the piece of code I got. X is equal to 1 plus 20 into 1 point, point X, point minus 7, sorry, minus X. This is so language which is converted to an intermediate language or machine language. Over here, you are able to see temp1 is equal to 1 plus 20. Temp2 is equal to minus X. X is equal to temp1 into temp2 okay so rearranging or rewriting the code is referred to as intermediate code generation and after getting the code the code is getting optimized you are able to see temp3 is equal to x into x and temp6 is equal to x into x so why we need to use for temp6 so remove the temp6 use temp3 over there so the the code is optimized and we remove unwanted variables so that the code execution will be faster so smaller size, consume less memory and it will be executed faster. And uh, finally the code is generated, so this is the final code generator based on the process you are using it. This is a human readable code and this is assembly language, assembler code. And this is free to the assembler, so assembler will take care of uh, converting your assembly language into machine code zeros and ones so that it will get executed in the computer. Okay, this is how the compiler design or compilers is working. You may ask me like uh, where we can get these videos. So this is our YouTube channel, WikiTiki Code. Just go to this channel and you can collect lots and lots of technology videos related to this particular technology and also like other technologies. And uh, these contents are available in this URL. Okay, just go to this URL and you are able to access all the contents in text format. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Which one of the following statement is false? I got four statements, uh, which one of these following statements is for? Context free grammar can be used to specify both the lexical and syntax rules. Type checking, type checking is done before parsing. Parse it and check it. So I don't think uh, type checking is done before parsing is wrong. So like, um, looks like this is wrong. Let's see, high level programs, uh, Language one can be translated to different intermediate representation. It's correct. Arguments to a function can be passed using the program stack. Maybe it's correct. Context free can be, can be used, especially for lexicon. Looks like uh, B is the answer. Let's see. Like I'm not sure about it. Let's see. Um, so compiler type checking is done after parsing. <laughs> after reading only, you are able to see the type check, right? So B is the answer. B is the answer. Let us move on to the next question. Consider a long lived TCP session with an entry and bandwidth of 1 GBPS. So, gigabytes per second. The session starts with a sequence number of 1, 2, 3, 4. The minimum time second is rounded to the closet integer before the sequence number can be used again is. Mm. 
you got 1 GBPS speed. The session starts with the sequence number of 1, 2, 3, 4 and you need to find the one the minimum time before the sequence number can be used again. So, obviously, the sequence number field of TCP is 32. So, 2 power 32, so we will be getting the possible sequence number of 0 to 2 power 32 minus 1. More than 2 power 32 bytes in TCP, that then you need to like uh, repeat this process. So, if it is 2 power 32 and lesser and you are able to manipulate, if it is more than 2 by 32, just go back and process it once again. And this concept is called wrap around. So, they called as a wrap around while sending sending unlimited data using TCP. They called as a wrap around. So, the time of wrap around is equal to the total data divided by the bandwidth. I got the data as uh, 32 bits, so 2 power 32. So, we need to be really careful because they give us a TCP second session. Indicates you need to go for 2 power 32 into 8 divided by 16. You got 34.35 seconds, the answer is 34. Over here, you have got 2 power 32. So, it is bytes, I am trying to convert the bits because the reason is like here bit per second. Now, let us move on to the next question, it is uh, question 7. Consider the minimum term list form of a Boolean function f given below f p q r s uh, m of a 0, 2, 5, 7, 9, 11 and d of 3, 8, 10, 12, 15. m denotes a minimum number and d denotes a do not care term. The number of essential prime implicants of the function is, looks like it is uh, related to digital logics and digital systems. Okay. It's related to Carnot map, I guess. Let's see. Over here, uh, like uh, you should understand the prime uh, implicants. So, what do you mean implicants? Implicants is nothing but the product or minimum term in the sum of products. Over here, I got A, B, A, B, C, and B, C. The implicants of this F is A, B, A, B, C, and B, C. The individual members. Uh, of an equation is called as implicants. And what will be prime implicants? Prime implicants are there, like you are able to see it here. What are the possibility of connection is happening? They called as prime implicants. What are essential prime implicants? No duplicates. This is the essential prime duplicant, prime implicants, no duplicates. And over here, what will be redundant prime implicants and the duplicate one? So, here is a duplicate one, this is called redundant prime duplicates and selective prime duplicates implicates indicates it is neither essential nor redundant prime implicates are called as selective prime implicates. This is not an essential one. Number of selective prime implicates is equal to true. The prime implicates for which neither essential nor redundant prime implicates are, are called as selective prime implicates. Over here, I got this one, the essential prime applicants, no duplicates. I got the redundant prime applicants. I got the redundant prime applicant and uh, over here, I got the selective prime applicant. It is neither essential nor redundant. Okay, So, this is called non-essential prime applicant. And let us talk about the implicants in Karnak map. While drawing it, you are able to see it here. This is the diagram. So, 0, 1, 5, 6, 7, and you got your uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, over here it is there. So, 9, it should be here 10, they are over like I, I can see it here. Yes, this is the one, this is the one. So, 0, 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, 7, 6, H. So, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 
it should be 14 here, 15 here. Okay, so this is how the map will be. So you got your 11, 13, 12. Okay, so these are the numbers. Okay, so these are the numbers I am trying to match it. Let us go back here. So these are the numbers I am trying to match it. So l l this one is 11, 12, 13, 15. Yeah, it is correct. Okay, the number of implicants are H. The combination is H. You are able to get H here. The total number of implicants. Okay, so whatever combination you can put it, you can put it, you will be getting H. Okay, the primary implicants are it is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That is the primary implicants, and uh, the like uh, you will be having the essential replicants. The essential primary implicants are so no 5, only 1, 2, 3, 4, and the repeated like uh, redundant primary implicants are only the 5. Okay, so only 5. So this is how this is how you are able to find it and the number of selective prime implicants is equal to 0. Over here this is how the Carnac map is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So obviously we will be having 0, 1, 2, 3, over here 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 14. So, this is how you will be designing your Karnak map. Okay. So, once if we design it, so 0, 0, 2, 7, 5, 9, 11 and you will have a D of a 3, comma 8, comma 10. So, 3 is X, 8 is X, 10 is X, 15 is X and 12 is X. Once if you draw it, they, so consider the minimum li term list for a from a Boolean a function F given below. M denotes a min term and D denotes a do not care term. This one is a min term, this is a minimal term and uh, D is the do not care term. I do not want this terms. The number of essential prime implicants of the functions are obviously like you will be having here is the 1, here is the 2 and here is the 3. So, you got 3 here. Uh, these are the primary implicants okay? or else if you discard this one because it is linked with the like do not care also 1, 2 and 3. So, the answer is 3. Okay, you may ask me the question like uh, what, what kind of company I am running. So, I am running a company like a Kashiwi Infotech. We are currently lots and lots of implant training and internship for the students. If you are looking for any implant training or internship, you can contact us. This is for the degree studying students and uh, degree completed students and also like uh, job seekers. And our company Kashiwi Infotech, we are providing lots and lots of courses in the weekends and weekdays. So, you can contact us uh, at this particular numbers. It is not specified here and you can contact us via the numbers specified here. Okay, let us move on to the eighth question. So, consider the following uh, problem L of G denotes the language generated by a grammar L of uh, grammar G. L of M denotes the language accepted by a machine M, and there are four options available, and uh, these are the things available. Let us see. Okay, so like uh, they are given, uh, like I got L of G, it is grammar G, L of M for machine M. Over here, for the language, for the language, you are able to see it here. This is the one, the enumerable language. Okay, for this one, everything is undefined. Which one is undefined? Membership problem. So the first one, membership problem, is undefined. Regularity problem. 
it is undecidable an equivalence problem the regularity problem. So, this one undefined. So, over here the regularity problem is undefined the equivalent pro property is undefined and the membership property is undefined ok. Over here for an unrestricted grammar G and a string W whether W is belongs to L of G we cannot tell it it is undecidable. Giving a Turing machine whether LM is regular no. Giving two grammar of G1 G2 whether LG1 and a language of G1 G2 is same no equivalence problem is not there. Okay, obviously, that this should be the an answer. Let us see. Given an NFA, whether there is a deterministic PDA, P is such that N and P accept the same language. Given a DPDA, okay, so given a PDA, deterministic PDA, D and a NFA, deciding whether they both accept the same language or not is desirable. Yes, this is correct. So, option 4 is the answer. Okay, so, 1, 2, 3 are undecidable, yes. So, this is the answer. Let us move on to the question. Let G be a finite group of 84 elements, the size of the largest possible group subgroup. What is the subgroup? So, it is like a divisible by the number. Okay, so, divisible by the number. So, 84 divisible by 42, divisible by like 28, 84. I am trying to make uh, the divisible numbers 84 is divisible by 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 12, 14, 21, 28, 42 and they are asking like which is the largest possible subgroup it is 42. Let us move on to the next question. Consider a system with a 3 process that share of 4 instances of the same resource type. Each process can request a maximum of a k instances. Resource instances can be requested and released only one at a time. The largest value of k that will always avoid the dock is. So, it is a 3 process that share 4 instances. So, the largest value should be approximately of 3 or 4. Let us see. You should understand what is deadlock. Deadlock is nothing but the P1 is there, this guy is holding R1 and is waiting for the resource R2 to complete. Okay, and if R2 is not available, they can't, this is called hold and wait concept. Over here, I got a process, this like a, this needs an R1 and it is holding R2. Process P1 holds, process P1 holds R2 and requests R1 to process. And process P1, P2, like uh, he holds R1 and is looking for R2 to process. Okay, so, this is how the deadlock happens. So, like uh, I am having something, I am looking for something okay, and it is not coming. So, it is called a deadlock. So, two approaches are really important to avoid the deadlock. So, do not process, start the process if its maximum requirement might lead to deadlock. So, the maximum requirement of this guy to finish the process will meet the deadlock. Do not grant any incremental resource request if this allocation might lead to deadlock. If there is a deadlock is going to happen, do not increase the resources. So, these are the two approaches. And the two algorithms are based upon it. One is a resource allocation graph, the other one is banker's algorithm. So, these two algorithms are really an important for deadlock avoidance. So, I got process P1, P2, and P3. And this guy is trying to access for the four instances. Okay, so four instances, and what could be the answer? The number of process is P is 3, resource is R. So, deadlock free condition is R is greater than or equal to P of n minus 1 plus 1. Okay, so, R is the total number of resource. So, 4 is greater than or equal to 3 into n minus 1 plus 3. So, 3 greater than or equal to 3 n minus 3 plus 2. Okay, over here I got uh, over here like what I have done. 4 is here, 1 is here. So, 1 is coming here, it will become 3. 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 is greater than 3 n minus 1. Obviously, n minus 1, 3 and 3 is getting cancelled. n minus 1 is 1 is greater than or equal to n minus 1. So, obviously, moving it here, you got 
2. So n is less than or equal to 2. So that's the answer. So the largest value of k that will always avoid deadlock is 2. So more than 2, it will, it will have a deadlock. Okay. Let's move on to the next problem. A lexical analyzer, compiler design. T1, T2, and T3 is A. T1 is equal to A question mark of B bar C into A. T2 is this one, T3 is this one. So, which one of the following will get this output? I want B, B, A, A, C, A, B, C. I want this one. Okay, so I want this one. Let's see, like, uh, let's rewrite this one and let's do it. Over here, Over here, like uh, considering I got my, so I got my T1 here. The T1 can be written as uh, it is MTR A B plus C. So, MT plus A B plus C So, MT plus A B plus C into A MT plus B and A plus C into B, MT and C into B plus A into C. So, this is how I can write it. Okay. Now, let us move on here. This can be rewritten like this also, like this also. T3 is equal to B plus, so obviously, it can be an MT1, it can be MT1 or it can be A also. Okay, so, I am going to write it like, so, B plus C, this can be written as B plus C into A. So, I got MT here, MT is allocated here. The next one is A into B plus C into A. Okay, I made some combinations. So, MT into A plus C into B plus B into A plus C into B. T3 equal to like uh, f long plus c f long into like mt into b plus a b plus a into c so this one will join with this one and this one will join with this one to form this one okay i got my t2 t1 t3 bit more elaborating i want like a b b a a c c a b c so this is the one i want b b a a c B B A A C. So B B A A B B A A. It's not here. It's not here. It should be here. So T three. The answer should have T three. Okay. Everyone is having T three now. But so like uh, the first one is should be T three, right? So this is the guy who got the first one as T three. So this should be the answer. Okay. But we can so this is the answer but still we can like a uh, fine tune once again so i'm segregating here i'm segregating here a b c if you put a b c here a b c i want so it's very simple a b c simple you got the answer okay this is how you are able to get it or you will be having c a or oh, it's not there now obviously this is the answer Deriving this one will get. So, the answer is a T3 and T3. Hi, our company Kashi Vin Product, we are providing lots lots of training for the students for the degree studying, degree completed people, you can contact us. And apart from this, we are conducting courses for the students, you can contact us at this number. Okay, I am tired. Let us move on to the next question. Consider the following processor design characteristics, register register arithmetic operation, fixed length instruction format, hardware control. The risk. For this is for the characteristics above are used in the design of risk processor. Looks like mm, hardware control unit is there for the risk processor. So no, and it should be here. Okay, let's talk about. Uh, so option A is the not an answer. So let's talk about the risk processor. So risk processor is nothing but this is how the uh, the thing is like the architecture of the risk processor. So the third point, hardware control unit is available here. Okay, so obviously it will have an uh, instruction cache and data cache and everything. So risk will know enormous number of lines, uh, a reduced instruction set, and CISC is going a lot of complex things. 
we talk about the difference of risk and CISC, CISC gives importance to hardware, risk gives importance to software. Okay, it's a complex intersection, it's a reduced intersection. It accesses memory directly, it access the it requires the registers. Coding in CISC is simple, and uh, you got a lot of lines here. So I can consist of complete instruction, it takes multiple cycles to execute. For the complex instruction, it will take lots and lots of cycles to execute. It's a simple instruction, it will execute in a single cycle itself. Complexity lies in the microprogram, complex lies in the compiler itself. Okay, this is the difference between the CISC and the RISC architectures. Now, let's move on to the question. The RISC processor will have support mode registers. ALU operations are performed only on the register data. Support fixed length instruction format and uses hardware. Looks like uh, all the three are correct. Now, let us move on to the post order traversal of a binary tree. So, binary tree will have a, a root and you will have a child. So, it will have two childs, they call this binary tree 89674523. The in order travels of the same tree is 86942. So, the height of the tree is the length of the longest path. We need to find the height of the binary tree. So, you should understand like what is traversal. In order will have the left first, followed by the root and followed by the right. So, 4, 2, 5. The left is finished. So, 1, 3. They called us in order. If it is a root, a root left and right, it is a pre order. So, root is 1, left 2, left 4, 3 or it is 5, it is 3. This is called a pre order. If it is post order, it should be left, so it is a left right root. Okay? It should be 4, 5, 2, 3, 1. This is called a post order and if you talk about the breadth first search, it should be breadth first search, you will have 1, 2, 3, 4, Five. This is called a breadth for search. Okay. I think uh, let's move on to the problem. You got the post order eight nine six seven four 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 five two three one. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The post order is eight, nine. 6, 7, 4, 5, 2, 3, 1 and the in order is like 8, 6, 9, 4, 7, 2, 5, 1, 3. So, obviously, this is the tree. So, looks like it is correct. The tree is like 1, 2, 3, 4. The length is 4. The height of the tree is 4. So, you will be getting lots and lots of our video contents in this particular channel. Check it out. Okay, now it is networking. The maximum transmission unit of 600 bytes. So, you got the data of 4500 bytes and there is a 20 byte IPv4 header and 40 bytes of TCP header. The packet is forwarded towards the router with a maximum transmission unit of 600 bytes. And the IPI header on the outgoing fragment is 20 bytes. The fragmentation offset value stored in the first fragment is 0. And the fragmentation offset value stored in the third segment is, which one is the answer? So, obviously, it can't be an answer. Okay, it can't be an answer. And it can be 72, 144 or 216. Let us see. Before that, you should understand the concept of networking. Networking in the sense like it can be like it is via the protocol the data is getting transferred. The protocol is separated into multiple areas like the application is accessing the TCP protocol and it is accessed by the IP protocol followed by internet. In each and every protocol to my data, the my data like it is a big data, it is segmented and there is a header is added into the top front of it. You are able to see the header here. Okay, so what is the maximum transmission unit? They may ask in the interview. You should be really careful, and they ask in the gate question also. 
for WLAN it's 7951, token ring it's 4464, FDDI it's 4352, Ethernet it's 1500 and X25 it's 576. And maximum transmission unit is a sense, uh, what is the largest IP packet I can transfer via the router is called a maximum transmission unit. And they call this fragmentation, the reason is like I got a very big data, I fragment it, make it as multiple parts, add the headers and you can send it. Okay, so over here you are able to see it here. This is called maximum transfer unit. So I got my uh, 4460 plus 20. So I can transfer only 580, 580 plus 20. Okay, this is the transfer unit. Okay, so like uh, you are able to see a picture here. So to explain how this is working. Over here. I got the original packet which is of 4000 since minus 40 bytes uh, which is the header so minus 40 it's a 23960 so I need to transfer 3960 bytes uh, to the destination the maximum data can be transferred is 1500 okay so I got so the 1500 is the maximum length I can send as a segments okay you got your 8 bytes which is the header and 40 bytes is IPv6. You got uh, 1496 minus 40. Minus 40. Okay, so you will be getting 1456 and minus 18 is minus 8. So the data length which is transferred is 1448 and the other one is 1448 and it's 1064. So adding this one and this one and this one, you will be getting this one. Okay, this is how the data is uh, fragmented and it is transferred to the destination. Okay, so let us move on to the next question. So, this is the problem question 14. <clears throat> Over here, I got the maximum transfer unit is 600. Okay, and the payload is 20 bytes. 600 minus 20 is 580 bytes. Since it is in like uh, bit, bit rates, uh, obviously, like we should be careful by multiplying with 8. While multiplying 72 into 8, you got 576 bytes. Okay, so I want that the kth of the fragmentation offset value stored in the fifth fragment is 0, the fragment of the third segment is so the k value is 3. The fragment size is a 576 into 3 minus 1 divided by 8, you got the answer is 144. Okay, so you need to memorize this formula. Let us move on to the next problem. Consider the following pass tree for the expression this one. Involving two binary operators dollar and ash, which of the following is correct for the given pass tree? Mm. <clears throat> Over here, the dollar is having the higher precedence. Usually, dollar will have higher precedence. So, this is wrong and this is wrong. Over here, once like if it is like a dollar is higher precedence and it is left associate or right associate and the ash should be the opposite one. So obviously, like a dollar as higher precedence good, correct and it is left associate correct and ash is not, it is right associate. So this is not correct and seeing the answer itself, you can tell the answer is A, the answer is A, okay, let us see. That's it. That's uh, no need to talk about it. If the answer is uh, like a uh, A is the option. Let T be the binary search tree with the 15 nodes. The minimum and maximum possible heights of T. It's a binary search tree. Obviously, like the maximum nodes can be 14. So because uh, that is a root node, 14 nodes can be written. Okay. So it should be the maximum and minimum possible height of T is 1, 2, and 3. So, this is not an answer, maybe 3 is an answer and uh, 15 nodes are there, the maximum height can't be 15, the reason is you should leave the root node, right? So, 14 is the answer, so possibly the answer is 3 and 14, 3 and 14 is the answer, let us see. So, you got a lot of explanation, but answer is 3 and uh, 14, 3 and 14 is the answer. 3 and 14 is answer. Okay, I think uh, we are reaching the end of the session. 
Thanks for watching this video. Like our company, Kashi Infotech, is we are providing a lot of implant training internship for the students, for the degree studying students, college like uh, completed people, job seekers, and everyone. And apart from this, like uh, I got a lot of courses with me, and I'm the trainer. I'm training personally for the students. And if you're looking for any courses, you can contact me at any time. And uh, these are our YouTube channels. Like uh, you will surely love it. You got we got lots lots of videos. Almost ten thousand videos are loaded in these channels. Just check out the channels. And thanks for watching this video. I'm not feeling well. Thank you. Thank you. Please share this to your friends. Thank you.